What is the appropriate way to prepare for Gimel Tammuz? I suppose the, the one word answer to that question is with your eyes open as opposed to with your eyes closed. In general, all of us understand, all of us know, that the reality of life of Elam Hazer for serious people is a very serious thing. And although it's very meaningful and it's very uplifting and it's even joyful, but it's very serious and it's very responsible. And uh, along with the living of life, there is the earnestness, the responsibility, the Yiddish Shamayim that goes along with it. This is always true. And when we talk about uh, what the Rebbe calls Benegeta Yud Shvat, Yom HaGodol Kodish, the great and holy day. And in this case, of course, we're talking about Gimel Tamos, that earnestness, that Tmimos, that Erenskite, um, needs to be a part of our approach. The earnestness excludes a sadness, a sense of defeatism. It certainly excludes a callous reish, a frivolousness or an indifference or an apathy. And... Um, there's no room in, the, in this arena for defeatism for the simple reason that it's not an option. It's not a choice. It's not one of the alternatives, one of the options, bechlal in life, and then certainly in the life of a yid and a chosid. So you approach Gimbal Tammuz, as challenging as it is, and as responsible as it is, and as serious as it is, and as, for some people, heavy as it is, with the, with, the eye, with, the, with the sense of responsibility and with our eyes open. Uh, 24 years are going to pass uh, on this Gimel Thomas. And there is ample time for uh, the Hizgalos, there is ample time for Mashiach to come and that we can have a Gimel Thomas that will only be celebrated in a positive way and there will be no underlying, no aspect of it which is uh, negative or sad. And uh, we believe with Anemis in, in the Gyula, Mashiach, and therefore we believe with Anemis in that very real possibility of having a Gimel Tamas that will be a Freilach, a Gimel Tamas exclusively. All of us believe with Anemis that the words that the Rebbe speaks are real and they're serious and they're eternal. And the Rebbe made it very clear, not once, but multiple times, many, many, many times, that we are the last generation of Golos, and we're the first generation of Geula, and that he, Nezeh, Melech HaMashiach, Bob, Mashiach is coming imminently, amongst the various different ways the Rebbe articulated it. The Rebbe said that the avoid to bring Mashiach is complete, and the avoid now is L'Kabba Pei Mashiach Tzitkenu, so we know how imminent the coming of Mashiach is, in addition to all of the above, we know that the Rebbe said in Shoftim and Tavshin and Aleph that this uh, uh, assertion, argument, statement that we're holding in the times immediately before the Gals of Malach HaMashiach, the Rebbe is saying as a Nevo, as a prophecy. And uh, in general, by Hasidim, there's an understanding that every word that comes from a Rebbe's mouth as in Yifaruch HaKedish and Nevo, like it says, Taki in that very Sikh in Parshat Shoftim that the Alter Rebbe said about the Baal Shem Tev and the Mezitcher Magid, that they were Nevi'im, because they were Magid Asides, Kalea La Saida, they predicted the future in a way which only a Novi can know, and the Tzemach Tzedek continues and he writes that Gam Mizikni by the Alter Rebbe we saw uh, in Yonim of uh, Nevuah, which can only be known by Derech Nevuah, and then of course the Rebbe continues to say that all the Rebbeim, uh, had the din of a Novi, this is an issue that I know that has some controversy, but certainly the way the Rebbe learned Shittas HaRambam, there's no question that the Rebbe holds that there can be and that there are Nevi'im, also in and also in Chutzla, that's and so on. 
Um, so in general, Hasidim take the words of the Rebbe um, with an earnestness, with a seriousness, uh, like it says in the Chumash about Meisha Rabbeinu and his Navua, that the words of a Tzadik, of a Rebbe, of a Nasi Yisrael are for sure true. But particularly in this case that the Rebbe said explicitly that he's saying this as a Navua, that the, the imminence of the coming of Mashiach, the fact that we're the last generation of Gauls, the first generation of Gauls, and we've experienced many many of the Simone Hagiyula, the not good ones and the good ones, is a Navua, is very serious. We all know how our lives changed with the strike of the pen from the Rebbe. The people wrote the Rebbe hundreds, thousands of letters a day. And the Rebbe read them all and did what he needed to for each person. Some of them he answered in writing, some he didn't answer, some he took to the oil. Whatever the Rebbe's cheshboinus warned is of course beyond us. But when we received a minor, a chuba from the Rebbe, on a letter we had written, and we may have spent hours and hours preparing that letter, and the Rebbe spent a moment or two or a second or two reading that letter. All of us are familiar with the speed and the thoroughness with which the Rebbe would read the notices that were sent to him and he would make a mark with a pen and our lives would change. In all areas, in health, in panasa, in shiduchim, in shlichis, in the chinuch of our children. And we were never disappointed. We were only disappointed if we didn't listen and we paid the price for not listening. So the Rebbe's words have always been proven to be the words of HaKadosh Baruch And something which the Rebbe spoke about not once or twice, but this was his entire Matthias, the end of, of, of the Esgals of Melech HaMashiach, bringing Mashiach, revealing Mashiach. And he articulated that we are the generation of the Geula. Certainly this is a very real thing, it's a very imminent thing, it's a now thing that Mashiach can come and must come and we're waiting for him. And this is true even though all these years have passed. And the idea, chas v'sholem, to say, as I've heard some say, that the Rebbe was hoping and the Rebbe was trying and the Rebbe was davening is not at all acceptable. Um, because that's not the, what divin navi are. Um, that's, it's not a tefillah, it's a navua. It's stating what he sees. But none of us expected that in Tavshi Nayan Ches, 24 years, since Gimel Tammuz and 27 years since the Rebbe spoke to Sikha of Shaiftim and all the other in Yarm, the Rebbe spoke about Mashiach, we would still be sitting in Golos and in a Golos which is so dark that uh, for many of us doesn't, we, there's a numbness to it almost. We don't feel the darkness. And Fabrenging about Gimel Tammuz. Um, and it, it's difficult. It's difficult. It's difficult to sit in Fabreng before Gimel Thomas. And I don't want to bring on anybody else a Mother Shreda. I got enough of my own, and everybody has enough of their own. The purpose of a Fabrengin is not to add to people's heavy mood, but to add a mood of upliftedness. And there's a Sikha from the Rebbe, actually, from the first period of time after Yudshvat, where the Rebbe said by a Fabrengin publicly that someone wrote him a letter that every time he looks at a picture of the Rebbe, meaning the Friedrich Rebbe, he cries. So the Rebbe said to him, and it's printed in the Sichas Habecham Gifrekt, Vasatuv Geton Zayn Venen. I asked this particular chassid, what has the crying achieved? The, the thing that matters, the thing that's relevant is what are we going to do about it and how we're going to make it work. And Tredin, which are a fact of life, uh, are ultimately not helpful. I want to begin with the following, just a thought that occurred to me. There's a letter which the Rebbe started writing in Ksav Yat Kedish, in his own hand. He wrote three or four paragraphs and uh, he didn't finish the letter. And the letter, in its partiality, in its lack of completeness, of course the Rebbe never sent it out because he didn't finish the letter, um, was printed. And the spirit of that letter was written to Bishvat Tavshin Yudalif right after the first year after the Estalkos. And the spirit of the letter is, the Rebbe's beginning the letter by writing that, that there is an inevitability of time. As time passes, you get used to everything. As time passes, a situation which was completely unacceptable yesterday becomes the way we live, the way we are. And he brings the Pasuk, um, uh, whatever it is, and so on. And um, the Rebbe is addressing the tendency of people to forget 
and to become complacent and to accept, in effect, a new status quo. What I want to observe about this letter is two points. A, they never began to write it. And B, he never completed it, they never sent it out. And I think there's a lesson in both of these things. The fact that the Rebbe began to write it is because the Rebbe considered that there was room, that there is room for this reality. And it's not just a theoretical idea, it's a real idea. On the other hand, the Rebbe was not, did not finish the letter and never disseminated the letter. And perhaps the, Rebbe, the reason the Rebbe did not disseminate the letter is because the Rebbe felt that it's, it's possible, it's realistic, that as much time passes, the, uh, the passion of Chassidim and his Kashros and, and continuing the work that the Rebbe wants to be done and the waiting for Mashiach could continue without any uh, lessening. And the fact that the Rebbe was on the of this letter to me means that the Rebbe is saying in effect that a Rebbe is a timeless thing and that the ability for Chassidim to connect to a Rebbe is a timeless thing ability. Uh, after all of these years, there's a whole new generation of children, boys and girls, that are now men and women, who never met the Rebbe, don't remember the Rebbe, who were literally born after Gimel Thomas. And, um, and they're growing up, many of them, to be the Rebbe Shluchim, the Rebbe's Chassidim, and they have all the passion and more passion and all the hesedidus of people who spent years and years and years in the Rebbe's Dalai Ramas. And in many cases, their hesedidus exceeds our own. And um, on the other hand, unfortunately, there is all kinds of yiridus that have taken place uh, since Gimel Thomas. Um, I think it is a truth to say of our time that uh, we're living in a time of that light and darkness are existing uh, at the same time, concurrently. When the Ebishter created the world, he separated Eir from Cheshach, light from darkness. But before the Ebishter separated light from darkness, light and darkness were together. We're living in a time that on the one hand there's so much Eir, and on the other hand there's so much sad Cheshach. When you talk about Eir, of course, you mean the oil of uh, the growth of Chassidus, of Shlichus, and of a whole new generation of Chassidim who are growing up with an incredible enthusiasm and a spirit of his kashas to the Rebbe. And uh, specifically, um, what's happening in the world, the incredible changes that are happening in the world that I think it's pretty impossible not to see how the Ebishter is navigating the world in the direction of this Gals of Malach HaMashiach. Or to use the language that the Rebbe employed some 27 years ago, where the Rebbe said that there are two levels, there's two concepts. One level, one concept is called Nefloi Sarenu. My Tav Shin Nun Aleph, the Rebbe said was Haya Tehei, Hei Tav Shin Nun Aleph, Haya Tehei Shnas Nefloi Sarenu. It was and it will continue to be a year that, the, that there are wonders that the Ebishter shows us. The opposite of Neflois, Arenu, is Arenu Neflois, which is a Pesach in Tanakh. And the Rebbe said, what's the difference between Neflois, Arenu, and Arenu Neflois? Neflois, Arenu means Hashem does incredible wonders. But they have to be shown to you. And until they're shown to you, you don't see them. We experienced unbelievable Nisim and Neflois then, at that time, uh, with the Gulf War and the collapse of the Soviet Union and many other things. But we saw them as miracles because the Rebbe pointed them out. And the Rebbe said, it's taka, a great thing, when the Rebbe points out a nest and we see it. But the fact that you need someone to point the miracle out to you shows that there's a certain limitation on the nest. Then there is something called that and flies, and the words of the Rebbe, where the Ebishter himself shows you the one. The things happen in the world, which is clearly the Ashgach of the Ebishter, where you see clearly Gile Yalakus, where you see the, way the, world, the direction in which the world is going, that this is, the Ebishter himself is allowing us to see or forcing us to see or making it impossible not to see changes in the world that are in the spirit of how the Rebbe spoke about the times leading up to the coming of Mashiach Tzikainu. Especially what's happened in the last few months.
we believe that this world is governed by the Ashgach HaVakadosh Baruch. We believe that this world is Hashem's world. And the Hashem is a balabayas over His world. And what happens in His world happens the way it happens because Hashem wishes it to happen. And the fact is, HaKadosh Baruch Hu created a world of Teiv and Ra, of good and evil. And historically, there have been many, many good things that have happened in the world, and there have been many evil things that have happened in the world. Tragic things, terrible things. But our belief is that just like good things come from a good God, bad things have to do with the Eibish Hashkacha, and they wouldn't have happened without the Eibish Hashkacha. Why they happen, there are all kinds of explanations, and I don't think explanations are explanations anyway, because when you explain an emotional question, with a rational or a logical answer, you really resolve nothing. But the fact is, we believe that whatever happens in the world happens by the Yad Hashem. But it also means that nothing negative happens unless there's a purpose that the Ebishta has for it to happen. So when the Rebbe says that we're holding by Mashiach, that means that the world can only go in a good direction. And when things happen, then we wondered between Tovshin Nun Dalad and Tovshin Ayin Ches, what the direction the world is going in. And we wondered where the words of the Rebbe, that they were going towards Tzedek V'yesha, towards righteousness and fairness. I remember the Rebbe spoke at Sicha, Pashas told us Tovshin Nun, that the whole spirit of that Sicha was that there are changes taking place in the words of the Rebbe in a halba welt, in half a world. The Rebbe listed China and India and Russia. And in population, China and India and Russia are half a world. The Rebbe said in each one of these countries there's change. And in each country the changes are going in the direction of righteousness and fairness and the individual rights and so forth and so on. And the Rebbe says, how could a person not see this and see the imminence of the Gula? But it's been a long time since then. And a lot of times you wonder where is the continuation of all of those words, all those in the voice? And now, in the last few months, we're beginning to see events that are happening in the world that are so undeniably, in the spirit of Mashiach, goodness in an incredible way, in a change in the world, in the direction, and so on and so forth, all happening with Dera HaTeva. And the, one of the things that I think we should learn from this, that's obviously true, is that accidents and bad things don't happen in the Abishta's world if the Abish does not want them to happen if they don't serve a purpose. They don't happen by mistake. And if the Rebbe says we're holding by Mashiach and we're holding by the ultimate goodness and kindness, the only direction the world can go in is the direction of goodness and direction of kindness. So perhaps this is a bit of an overstatement, but when you look at what's happened in the last few months, you see not only miracles, but you see miracles in the category of Arenu and Eflois, where no one has to show them to you. They're so plain. They're so obvious and they're so incredible that um, the Eibish the himself is showing us these Nisim and Eflois. This is an idea that the Rebbe spoke about, I think it's the beginning of the Sikh of Tazriyam and Tzedah, Tavshin and Aleph, the beginning of that Fabreng, and the Rebbe made the point that I just made about the Eflois, Aden, Aden, and Eflois. So you see incredible Gili Alakus. On the other hand, there's so much Chayishech, there's so much Halom Behester in the world, in our community, there is a, a lot of change that's not favorable in terms of the matzav of Anash. And uh, we very, very much miss the physical presence of the Rebbe. Because the physical presence of the Rebbe moves all of us just by the Rebbe's being in our Dalaramis. And of course, we all believe that that's still true. And we don't believe that that's still true in some esoteric way. We mean it bepashtus, the way the Rebbe himself described the continuation of the life of the Friyadik Rebbe after Yud Shvat. But the fact that you don't expect to look into the Rebbe's eyes or to look into the shul and be in the Rebbe's physical presence has taken its toll. A generation, a whole generation has passed and it's become harder and harder to be chassidim simply by the Rebbe's makif. Simply by the fact that in the Dal Damas of the Rebbe, the Rebbe made us all better. The Rebbe's a yid whose whole mitzvah is that he's Eved Hashem. Oh, he served HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Every breath, every tnua, every thought was Avodah Hashem in the most intense and the most powerful way. And we try to be Avodim L'Avdei Hashem. We want to be servants of the Rebbe. And uh, in our service of the Rebbe, we are closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We're better servants of the Ebishter. But you have to have a sense of the Master. You have to have the sense of the, of the Odin. 
And uh, when this becomes challenging and this becomes difficult, we all see the effect, we all understand and experience and know the effect of this halom is vestated. So we're getting ready for Gimel Thomas again. And we're all hoping that this year will be different. There'll be a, a Gili Alakus, a Hisgalos. And the Gimel Thomas will have only the upside of what Gimel Thomas is without the downside of what Gimel Thomas is. But we're still getting ready for Gimel Thomas. And it's, it's hard. It's hard to do. And it's particularly hard to do with your eyes open. But you can't do it any other way. A person has to approach it with a responsibility and with a maturity. So, of course, the, the message of the Rebbe is in the Maim of Yata Tetzave. Now, um, I don't want to get into Vikuchim about this with people. Uh, we live in a, a world where, as the Rebbe often said, every person, every chassid, and all of us are trying to do the right thing. And our kavon is ritzuya. There's a sikha from, there's a letter from the Rebbe, which is printed in the beginning of the Agdomah to the Sefer Teda Shalom, where he writes about chassidim making hanoches in the Teda of their Rebbe. And he says, all chassidim were serious mukushadim. And every word that the Rebbe said mattered to them extraordinarily. It was very important to them. And they were all dedicated to the emes of the Rebbe's kavona and the Rebbe's avoida. So... The Rebbe, in that letter, writes, in effect, you can, you, you can assume that a Hanukkah transcript written by a Chosid was written with as, as much attention and effort as humanly possible to be mechaven la mitasah shaldova. Every Chosid wants to do the right thing. and Every Chosid has his feeling, his hergish, and his direction. And I'm not certain, I'm certainly not the, the Baal hergish. I don't have any... Uh, special authority in any way, shape, or form. But at least from my perspective, the Hachon of Gimel Tamas is with the Maimah V'yata Tetzave. And of course, the Maimah V'yata Tetzave is one of those Maimodim that Taka goes into the category of Adana Neflois, if you will. If you want to compare the, the Maimah V'yata Tetzave to the Maimah Bosi Lagani, you could say that Bosi Lagani is Neflois Adenu and V'yata Tetzave is Adana Neflois. In other words, for a person to learn Basi Lagani and to see how Basi Lagani is the hero for our generation, you need the Rebbe to explain. To learn the Maimah Vyata Tetzave and to appreciate how the Maimah Vyata Tetzave is a hero for our generation speaks for itself. It's identical. It's very obvious. This, this Maimah is speaking to all of us. And Vyata Tetzave, of course, is a very, very involved Maimah. It's a very, very involved Maimah. But the Nakut of the Maimah is the idea of Maisha Rabbeinu. But the Ebishter gave the world, gave Yidin, a Nasi, Meisha Rabbeinu. And as it says from the Zaya, that there is Pashtusa, the Meisha, Bechol, daughter of a daughter, in every generation, there is Meisha Rabbeinu, the Meisha Rabbeinu of each generation. And in each generation, the function of Meisha Rabbeinu is Viata Tetzave. And Viata Tetzave means, Lekasher, Lechaber, Es Yisrael, Limeid, and Sof. Like it says in the very beginning of the Maimir, that the meaning of the word Viata Tetzave doesn't mean like it normally means. That Moshe should repeat to us Hashem's words. But rather, Viyata Tetzave means that Moshe should do his shlichas. The Rebbe, the Nasi Bisol, has a shlichas, has a mission. And Viyata Tetzave is where Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu that he should connect Yidin to the Ein Seif. Viyata Tetzave, le kasher, le chaber, es Yisrael, le made Seif, to connect Yidin to the Ein Seif. And the Pashtus, when it says in the Maimah, Viyata Tetzave, that Moshe Rabbeinu's role is le kasher, le made in Seif, it means to connect Yidin to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but Davka to connect Yidin to HaKadosh Baruch Hu in a way which is above Ta'am Badas, which is above reason. That's what Ein Seif means. Like the Rebbe says in Peter Gimel of the Maimit, that other words for Lakash and Lechab Yisrael, the Ein Seif is Lazon or Lefanes as Yisrael, Binyan Amun, to provide Mezenes and Parnasa, which you could say perhaps means Pnimi and Makif, to the Jewish people, for you know, Amunah. What is Amunah? Amunah means a connection to HaKadosh Baruch, which is completely above our reason. In other words, what a Rebbe, what a Tzadik, what a Nasi Yisrael does, he touches the Yiddish and the and he strengthens the bond between the Yid and HaKadosh Baruch, that doesn't pass through the mind, doesn't pass through the Seichel, but comes directly from the Neshama. 
um, we live in the age of reason, or supposedly we live in the age of reason and logic and proof, and specifically of physical proof. And people are always saying, if it's true, why can't you prove it? If it's happens, why is it difficult to prove? Why is there no proof of this? Why is there no proof of that? Why do you have a kasha for this? Do you have a kasha for that? And the, those are all legitimate arguments. And of course, over the course of the Rebbe's Nasiyas, the Rebbe addressed many of them and answered them. Many answers, many of them repeated many, many times. But there's a very, very simple underlying truth that's very, very serious, very, very important. And that is, let's assume that you have good questions. And let's assume that the questions have answers. And let's assume that the questions disturb you and that it's making it difficult for you to serve the Ebishter. You have to ask yourself one underlying question. The underlying question is, can you afford it? Can you afford the questions? Can you afford the questions? Just like a person who has a medical issue and he goes to a doctor and he's asking the doctor all kinds of questions. And he's not going to take his medicine until he figures it all out. You can ask him a very simple question. Can you afford it? Can you afford to be busy with questions? Not because the questions aren't good, but because there's something much, much more important than the questions. That in the case of a doctor, it's to be healed. In the case of a yid, it's to live. You know, emuna is very important. Emuna is very important. Amuna means a connection to Hashem. And really, Amuna means a connection to Hashem that involves surrender. Surrender, getting rid of your seichel and being involved with HaKadosh Baruch Hu directly, intimately. Or to say it in other words, even if a person comes to the Eivishter with his moyach, even if a Jew comes to HaKadosh Baruch Hu with his mind, with his reason, with his rationale, as did Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu was the first Jew. But Avram Avinu's journey did not begin with his soul. Avram Avinu's journey began with his mind. And if a person were to use his mind to pursue an understanding of Alakus to the best of his abilities, based on the need for proof and understanding and rationalization and so on, and he, he, came to, he got answers, he, he, came, he got good answers, he, he's figured it out, so to speak. He's intellectually resolved all of his questions, he's crossed all the I's, that he crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's. He's found the answer to all of his questions. That person has no relationship with the Ebishter at all. Has a relationship with his ego and with his mind and with his rationalizations. To have a relationship with the Ebishter is like having a relationship with, a, with another person. To have a relationship with another human being, you don't use your mind. Maybe the mind can set the terms of the relationship. Maybe the mind can be used to, do, to ascertain whether you want the relationship or you don't want the relationship. But the relationship is not a rational thing. Relationships are very deep. It's even deep. It's not only not rational, it's not emotional. It's a spiritual thing. A bond between one person and another person, if it's a real bond, is not based on mind and heart. It's based on soul. And if you're so stuck up, so preoccupied with the looking for reasons and explanations, you never get to the point of it all. And the same is true in our relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that if a person insists on having to understand everything and prove everything, Assuming it can all be understood, assuming it can all be proven. But that's not the point. The point is to have a connection with HaKadosh Baruch And who can afford, who can afford to delay having a relationship with Abish did until he figures it all out? And that's what a Rebbe is. A Rebbe doesn't, of course, more than anybody else, he understands and he has proof and he has answers to questions and so on and so forth. But his role is Lakasher or Lachabes Yisrael, he made himself. His, his endeavor, his wish, his purpose is that a Yid's connection to Hashem should not pass through the mind, it should go directly from the soul to the behavioral life of a Yid, because that's the truth of a Yid, that he has a Neshama, and the Neshama doesn't need proof for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. he knows HaKadosh Baruch Hu inherently, the Neshama doesn't need proof for Matan Terem, for Terem Menashamayim, for all the other Yudgim Ikrim, and so on and so forth, because he knows them basically, and on some level, every Jew knows that this is the truth. But we get distracted, we get burdened, we get uh, caught up in kashis and shailis and all kinds of alumas ve stadium that take us away from this. And the whole role of a Rebbe is to, is, to, is to figure out how we can not necessarily ask questions and find answers, but have a relationship with Abish based on Amuna alone. I saw in one of the books that was written by Velvel Green, Al-Vashal, Professor Velvel Green, Al-Vashal, where he writes, amongst other things, he was a biologist, he was a scientist, a real scientist, that he figured out early on 
um, that the Rebbe was an inspired person. In other words, that the Rebbe didn't use the same tools he did. Bright guy, very, very smart man. But he understood that the Rebbe is in the category of a Navi. And he knows things that nobody else can know. And he sees things and he experiences things in a way that's very different than everybody else. And on that basis, there was a certain acceptance of the Rebbe, even when he didn't understand, and even when he had questions, and even when he felt that the Rebbe may have written things or said things, which perhaps the Rebbe should not have said, he had a basic understanding that he's talking about a Yid who's a seer, a Raya. It's in a different category. And uh, that was the basis for their relationship, and that's the basis for his Yiddishkeit, that he had a connection to the Rebbe who didn't prove things and explain things and rationalize things and make everything logically, but he raised him up as intelligent as he was, to a madreig of a munin. And it's fascinating that when he met the Rebbe the first time, I think it was the very, very first Yechidis, it was the Yechidis Kislev, I think, Tav Shechav Gimel. Um, the story has been written on many times. The Rebbe said, I want to ask you a favor. And the Rebbe asked him to buy himself a journal or a notebook. And that in this notebook, he should write down every time he sees in his life an event of Ashkoch HaPratis. Ashgach Pratis uh, is called in the secular world coincidence. But Ashgach Pratis is very different than coincidence. Because coincidence means an unlikely occurrence that occurs. A, a, a fortuitous event which happens by mistake. Something good happens without it, anybody orchestrating it. And of course... Uh, uh, Coincidences, if they are unorchestrated and they happen randomly, should happen very seldomly. It is a mathematical formula that can allow you to figure out what is the likelihood of a coincidence occurring. And the fact of the matter is that all over the world, in everybody's life, there are so many events that happen that are fortuitous, that are good coincidences. And the, the mathematics does not add up. In other words, the the strict rules that govern the likelihood of a good coincidence occurring is exceeded by the reality of coincidence by thousands of percent. It happens so, so much more often than it should if it's by mistake. And of course, the reason is, is because there's a mashgiach and there's a hashgacha. And the hashgacha is not just colors, but it's protest. It's very precise. It's very personal. And the Abish is involved in our lives. So the Rebbe said to a scientist, every time you see the Abish in your life, write it down. Now, I don't know what Rebbe's Kavana is, because, of course, we're not the Rebbe. But in a very balabatash way, what the Rebbe was saying to him is, let's get directly to the point. Instead of trying to answer all the questions and being involved in the burden of proof, so to speak, the questions and the answers and the proof, let's identify the Abish in our life directly, which takes us to a higher realm. It takes us to a place of faith where there are no questions. And when a person gets used to seeing Ashgacha Pratis in his life, he experiences the Abishta. He sees the Abishta. So what happens to the Kashas? The Kashas don't go away. The questions are still there. The questions still need answers. The proofs need to be resolved, to be provided. But it's a very, very different spirit in which the questions are asked and the proofs are sought. Because there is an understanding that whether I find the answer, I don't find the answer. Whether I find the proof, I don't find the proof, I know it's real. I know it's real because I see it in my life. And if I'm not mistaken, what Mr. Green writes in his safe it is that he never, he never bought the notebook and never kept the ledger, but he got the message. That when a person lives his regular everyday life, you see the hand of HaKadosh Baruch Hu constantly, and it establishes a bond, a relationship between us and him, which doesn't pass through the mind. It comes directly from the Neshama and to the Neshama. And that's what a Rebbe provides, Klal Yisrael, the Kasher, the Chaber, the Yisrael, the Emeri Sof. Lozon of the Fanas is Israel, Muna, to give us a connection to the Abishta which is not burdened by the heaviness of, of reason and proof. I saw someplace, and I can't remember where, but it's certainly worth mentioning that somebody asked the Rebbe that faith is without reason. And if you're an intelligent person, if you're a rational person, uh, you should feel the need to understand everything, to, to be able to explain everything rather than just to accept things. Like you frequently hear in, in, in today's day and age where people use the word blind faith, blind faith. The word blind faith is, is wrong. It's not blind faith, it's simple faith. Because there's nothing blind about faith. There's something very, very uh, eye-opening about faith. Blind means you close your eyes and whatever happens, happens. Faith isn't blind. 
Faith is transcendence. Faith is plain, but transcendent. You know, in the 19th century, it was popular to say that uh, faith is for the fools of the world. If you look at the world today, and you look at the emotional state of the world, you'll realize, if you're honest about it, that faith requires a lot of courage. Because it's much easier to be a pessimist. It's much easier to look at this world as a terrible place, filled with terrible people, and the likelihood of terrible things happening to a person. And instead of a human being living his life, he's surviving, trying to deal with all the evil in the, the world full of accidents. And for a person to believe that there is good, not just good in the world, but that the base of this world is good, and the base of the world is God, and that there's a purpose, and that there is a is incredibly courageous. Because it's very easy to be a Moreshchere. It's much more, to be pessimistic. It's much more difficult to be an optimist and to believe in goodness and to believe in God because they're really one and the same thing. God and goodness are the same. Because goodness is the opposite of the heaviness of nature. And goodness exists because Hashem exists. And it's His world. So faith, faith is courageous. So anyway, getting back to the question, this Yid asked the Rebbe, is it, so first of all, I want to say that I object to the terminology blind faith. It's just not, it's not, faith isn't blind. Faith is simple, but not simplistic. It's transcendent. It takes an incredible amount of courage to believe. And this person asked the Rebbe, how can a person who considers himself intelligent and rational be a believer? And the Rebbe gave him a very interesting answer, a very useful answer, a very wise answer. The answer that the Rebbe gave him was, it's a different skill set. It's a different set of tools. That was the Rebbe's answer. And I'm going to explain it the way I understand it. Would you consider a musician unintelligent? Would you be considered an, uh, an artist or a choreographer or a writer of poetry or literature unintelligent? Music and the arts are very different than, the, than, than mathematics and the physics and ke- chemistry and biology. They're very different. They're not intellectual in the same way. But you cannot say that a person's a musician is unintelligent. Even though music speaks a different language and it pulls on the heartstrings in a different way and it, speak, it says a different message to a different part of the human being in a way that's not connected to the mind. It's a different skill set. A musician can be brilliant in his chokhmah, but his music is not defined by his intelligence. His music is defined by what music is supposed to do, come from the soul and go to the soul. And the same is true with art. So there are things in this world which are very sophisticated, but they're not intellectual. And they're not considered less sophisticated because they lack intelligence. They're a different kind of sophisticated. So the Rebbe said the moon is the same thing. The moon is not without reason. It's, diff- it's a different thing. It comes from a different part of the person and has to do with a different kind of relationship that a person has with his environment, with other people, with the world around them, and ultimately with the creator and the master of the world, the Ebishter himself. And uh, like I said, faith may be simple, but it's not simplistic. And the Indian of a Rebbe is Lozon of the the made in Sof, to make the Ebishter real to us without it having to be filtered and convoluted and complicated by the mind and by the burdens of the world and so on. And that's what every Rebbe, every Tzaddik, every Nasib Yisrael does. He touches, he triggers the heart of a Yid and the Shom of a Yid and wakes up his connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which is beyond reason. But when the Rebbe in the Maim of Yata Tetzave talks about this, the thing you know, Meishar Rabbeinu, that a Rebbe, a Nasi B'Yisrael, a Tzadik, a Rebbe, a Nasi B'Yisrael, strengthens Yiddish Ha'emunah, he speaks about different generations, different Rebbes, and different ways in which the Ha'emunah is strengthened. Let me preface that uh, there's a famous letter from the Rebbe, a very famous letter from the Rebbe. Which the Rebbe Taka wrote on Gimel Tamas, I think Tav Shin Yud, Gimel Tamas, Tav Shin Yud. It's a short little letter, it was printed in the beginning of one of the contrasts that came out at that time. And the Rebbe begins with the words, Harbe Shayel and Bader Shem, Bashayel. 
what is the difference, what is unique about the Friya de Kirebbe, what sets him apart from the other G'dayli Yisrael of his generation. So the Rebbe has a list that he's a, a Gon, he's a Eved Kim, he's a Novi, Bamidus Tevis, and he, all, he goes through a whole series of milas that the Rebbe has, V'oid, V'oid, and then he finishes the list by saying that all of these things are true, all these things are true, that he's a Gon, and he's a Chassid, and he's a Chacham, and he's a Navi, and he's a Bamidus, and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, continues the Rebbe, Iker Chassid Kant, the most important thing is missing, and what's the most important thing? That he's a Nasi. What is the meaning of the word Nasi? So of course, any person who's learned Chassidus knows that the meaning of the word Nasi is that in Nitzut Sesha Yankav Avinu, and the word Rebbe is Reish Pnei Yisro, and we all learn Tanya Peirik Beis, where the Alt Rebbe brings the mitzvah sasei, the iraisa of Oladov Kaboy. But it says in the Pasuk, in the Chumash, Oladov Kaboy, that he does a chiyuv to connect himself to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So the Gemara already asks, how can a person attach himself to the Shechina? The Shechina is fire, and the Gemara answers, we should attach ourselves to the Tamidei Chacham. So the question becomes, what does that mean? It says in the Teiro Dafka boy, it's a mitzvah to cleave Takadish Baruch. When the Rambam Paskins, that it's one of the Tayak mitzvahs, it's a mitzvah to say the Raisa. How do you become attached to Takadish Baruch of attaching yourself to a tzaddik, to a chokham? Attaching yourself to a chokham is, in effect, saying Hashem gave me a mitzvah, which I cannot do, so I'll do something else which is similar to it, which is going to compensate for it. It's not, it's not. Fulfilling the chiyav of the teiru dafka bay because I'm not attaching myself to Hakadosh Baruch Hu. I'm attaching myself to a Talmud Chacham. Moreover, I'm not even attaching myself to the Talmud Chacham. I'm simply following his lead, learning from his midas, and so on and so forth. So how are you makayim the mitzvah dafka bay in a true way? So the Alter Rebbe answers that there is something called a neshama, and between one neshama and another neshama, there's a bond. Like it says in Tanya Pelek Lamed Beis, Hagufim Mecholakim. What separates one Jew from another is the body. And as much as the neshama is concerned, they're one and the same. This is true between every neshama and every other neshama, but it's even more true between the neshama and the reish b'nei Yisrael. Roshi Alpha Yisrael shall be called Vader, because the neshames of the Rebbe are reishu mechin lagabe the neshames ha'amein rami ha'aretz. That the Rebbe's neshama is the head, and we're our neshames are the feet or the body. In other words, in every single generation. The Abishta gives the collective of Jewish neshamas, which are compared to a fetus, to a body, right? Just like a fetus starts out at a single point. And when it diversifies, it's not just a bunch of division, but it's a variety of divisions. Some parts of that original seed are going to become the heart, the lungs, and the mind, the brain, eyes, ears, and so on. Some are going to become hair and nails and skin, but they all come from one point. Similarly, in the level of the neshama, all the neshama come from one point. And that point is the Reish Pnei Yisrael. So Odov Kabay is a literal mitzvah. The complication with Odov Kabay, of course, is that in order to fulfill the mitzvah Odov Kabay, number one, you have to be in touch with your own neshama. And number two, you have to be in touch with your neshama to such an extent that through your connection with your neshama, you're in touch with the neshama of the Nesiyah Adar. And number three, by you're in touch with your neshama in such a way that connects it to the Nesiyah Adar in such a way that it connects it to Atzma Samhos, to the to himself. Which is what a Rebbe is. What the true definition of a Rebbe is, a Pichsides, not Pichabola. His Neshama is the source of our Neshama. So the Mitzvah of is an actual thing on the level of the Neshama. In the level of his Dabkas Nucha Barucha, where Nayid is in touch with his Neshama. And now his Neshama is connected to all other Neshamas, and particularly to the Neshama of the Nesiyah Adar. And through the Nesiyah Ado, he's connected to Atmos and Musa in Sav Baruch Hu. So the mitzvah of Kabe is not Vimezakt, a second best, a substitute. Since it's impossible to fill, fulfill this mitzvah, literally, we're going to come up with an alternative, approximate, practical solution. It's a literal, what we call in the culture, is Kashras. The Neshama connection between the Yid and the Rebbe. And that through the Neshama connection with Yid and the Rebbe, the Yid is a connection to the Mebish. And that's the basis for the Vayata Tetzava. That's the basis for the Lakashir Lachaber as Yisrael the Medin Tzav. That's the basis for the Lozon and the Fanas as Yisrael Binyan Amun. In other words, the Eibish that gives us a Rebbe, a Tzadik, whose role it is to strengthen our Amun. And like I explained before, to avoid the distractions and to get us 
to the point of Amuna directly. And the pnimius of this, that there's an, there's an inherent bond between our neshama and his neshama, and alakus, and that neshama bond is actually Amuna itself. Having said all of this, there is another point of Atatetzava, which is perhaps, or perhaps more than perhaps, the most important part of the Maimir. And that is that it, 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 in conjunction with the Viata Tetzave, there is a concept which the Rebbe calls the Yikhu Elach. And this is not only important because it's deep and it's serious, it's important because this is really a practical message, right? The question is, how do I prepare for Gimel Tamas? And the Yikhu Elach is a real serious answer. Because what, how does the Rebbe explain the Vikhu and the Maimon? In the beginning of the Maimon, he explains Vikhu in one way. And at the end of the Maimon, he explains Vikhu in an entirely different way. And in effect, what the Rebbe is saying is this that a tzaddik, a Rebbe, a Nasi Bistral, a Neshama close, has the job of touching Yiddish and Neshamas and connecting them to Atma Sabbath, connecting them to Akadish Baruch Hu, Dafka on a level of Ein Seif, Dafka on a level of Amuna, which bypasses the Mayach and gets to the very heart, the very essence of what a Jew is and what his relationship with Akadish Baruch Hu is. But Kvayachal, there's limits. The ability for Meisha Rabbeinu, of course the language of the Maimon is Meisha Rabbeinu and Mordechai. The ability for Meisha Rabbeinu to connect to the Neshama of Yid, and wake up the Amunah spark within that Yid. And give him an Amunah connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu has limits based on circumstances. And the ultimate limit is, the way the Maimah develops, is that it's possible for a Tzaddik, for a Rebbe, to actually reveal the Yechidah Shebenefesh in a Chosset, to reveal the Yechidah Shebenefesh in a Yid. But when a Tzaddik reveals the Yechidah Shebenefesh in a Yid, what the Maimah calls Etzav Anisham, unilaterally, by himself, in other words, the chassid is only the receiver, the yid is only the makabal, and the entire mashpi is the rebbe. So if a tzaddik, a rebbe, a nasib Yisrael, when a tzaddik, a rebbe, a nasib Yisrael, succeeds in being makabal, the yichidah shebe nefesh, it's dovin nesef al techas ha-giluyim. It's dovin nesef al atzir shaloyim. That means the person who's being inspired is not being transformed. He's being overwhelmed. When a Yid experiences a Koyach from a Sidus Nefesh, when a Yid experiences a Koyach from a Sidus Nefesh, so obviously he's on a higher level. But as being on a higher level doesn't mean he's a higher person. It simply means he's been raised up to a higher level, but he's the same person he was before. And the proof is what happens when that challenge goes away. And the Rebbe Taka gave the Dugma in the Maimir, he didn't say it entirely explicitly, but it's quite obvious that Yidin lived in the Soviet Union. And they stood in a matzav of Mesiris Nefesh for decades, decades, to raise Yiddish a kinder under, the, under those conditions. To give a kosher Yiddish a to their children, to keep Shabbos and to keep kosher, and to have the frum a kosher a kinder when there was the constant fear that Rahman al Islam, the children, will be taken from them, and so on and so forth. So they stood in, the, in a state of Mesiris Nefesh in a perpetual way. Then those same people left Russia, came to America. So the Rebbe says, a nikid bahem kol kach inyana mesiris nefesh. They became like us. In a very short time, they became westernized. They lost that principle of mesiris nefesh. And the Rebbe said, how could that be? You spent so many years being mesa nefesh. How do you become a, a, a western zhlob, for lack of words? And the answer that the Rebbe gave is because the mesiris nefesh was not them. It was superimposed upon them. It came from outside of them. Stakader pintel yedei yechida. But it pushed aside their humanity, their mahus as people. And when their humanity as people reemerged, they were not Bali Mesiris Nefesh, they were regular people like anybody else. But the Rebbe says that's only true if the relationship between the Tzaddik, between Meshad Abed and the Nasib Yisrael, the Rebbe, and the Dod is unilateral. In other words, what the Rebbe gives them, we receive. But there's another possibility. And the other possibility is called Yechoi Lech. And this is really the ultimate point of the Maim of Yata Tetzavah. On an Avoida level, it's the ultimate point of the Maim of Yata Tetzavah. And that is that you don't just take what you give. You give your mind, you give your heart, you give your senses 
to make them kalim for the inspiration that the tzaddik, that the rebbe, that the nasi Yisrael gives. In practical words, this means that we were always taught in Chassidus Chabad, the rebbe said it in the very first Fabrengen, that Chabad demands, you don't just take from the rebbe, you have to give, you partner. And in our generation, this is called shlichus in all of its forms. And basically it means the idea that a Yid gives himself to the Rebbe's purpose, to the Rebbe's issues. You know, they, they talk about Chassidim having big arguments by a Fabrengen. Does the Rebbe need Chassidim or does the Rebbe not need Chassidim? This is a, an emotional question more than it's a philosophical question. Um, but in the Maimed, the Rebbe says that something much deeper happens in the Vyata Tetzava when there's a Vyikha Welech. That when a Chassid is not just a taker from the Rebbe, but a Chassid gives to the Rebbe. In his giving to the Rebbe, he is giving the Rebbe a deeper ability to affect the Vyata Tetzava. And the way the Rebbe says it in the Maimed, that the Gili of Yechidesh and Benefesh, not to be Kamei Dov and Neisav Akech HaSagiluyim, Dov and Neisav HaTzir HaKoyich HaTzir but what that means to say the Rebbe is explaining that it's one thing for a chassid to take from the Rebbe. It's another thing for a chassid to give. And when a chassid gives to his Rebbe by giving to the Rebbe, what the Rebbe gives him is much, much, much more. To the point that a chassid could be uplifted to the level in the language of the Maimed of a gil of Yechidisha benefesh in a Gauls of Ashidus because of chassid slamar from the fact that we find ourselves in Gauls. But what it means practically, and this is very, very important, that this is where a chassid meets his rebbe. It never was true that a chassid meets his rebbe by looking at his goof, or by getting from him a dollar, even though that's very real. Because the relationship between a chassid and a rebbe is a connection which changes us completely. It changes us from being creatures who live in El Mazer to creatures who live in the Yebishtah's world and have a divine purpose to make this world a better place. But that change could be that change could be the Rebbe gives and we take. And that change could be the Rebbe teaches us what we need to do and we do it. And the, the practical message is where does a chassid meet the Rebbe? And the answer is in the things he does for the Rebbe. Where does a chassid meet the Rebbe? In shlichis, in avoid the relationship with the Rebbe. In other words, the answer to the frustration and the Morash Chayra is not to wait for something to happen, but to do something. Because when you do, it happens. In other words, where does a Chassid see the Rebbe in his life? A Chassid sees the Rebbe in his life in the things that he does on behalf of the Rebbe Kfayachal, for the Rebbe. Again, however you want to uh, explore the question of a Rebbe needing Chassidim, a Rebbe not leading from the Gemara, and so on and so forth, we're not going to go into that question. Because I think whatever answer you give is right, whatever answer you give is wrong. I mean, the truth of the matter is, it's an atzmiyizdika relationship. But that's how the Rebbe says the Maimah, V'yata Tetzavah, Z'bnei Yisrael, V'yichoyilach, that Moshe connects Yidin to the Yibishter. And he connects Yidin to the Yibishter more deeply if there's a V'yichoyilach. And this, I think, is the, the practical side of this. As they get ready for Gimel Tamas, it's a, it's a day, it's a Yom Godl, it's a Yom Kaddish, which has to do with his kashas. Heskashas means the Nishama connection between the Rebbe, the Nasi Adad, and our Nishama. But Heskashas is not allowed to stay in the Nishama. It has to come down from the Nishama into the mind and into the heart and into the body and into our daily lives. And the Heskashas coming down into our daily lives means we experience the Rebbe in our life. Experiencing the Rebbe means experiencing Amunah. Experiencing the Rebbe means experiencing Simcha. Experiencing the Rebbe means experiencing Betachem. And experiencing the Rebbe means experiencing a Koyach to be pushed more Yiddish, have more Yiddish Shamayim, have more Avas Yisrael, have more ability to make of another Jew and more ability to connect ourselves to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Or basically where we prioritize, where what's important for us in our lives is not Gashmi is Dika things, but Ruchni is Dika things, because ultimately that's what life is about. It's not about the in Gelt is Yiddish Money and homes, real estate is not Jewish wealth. Jewish wealth is Yiddish kinder who follow in the footsteps of their parents. And this is the koyach that the Rebbe gives. And the Rebbe teaches us in the Maimed that there's a concept called Yikhoilach. I, I saw some place, and I'm not going to remember where, where uh, a Bachar asked Rebbe Mendel, Allah Shalom, Rebbe Mendel, 
Futafaz, the Chayna Lebracha, when the Rebbe made the Takon of Rambam, the Rebbe gave three possibilities. To learn three Prakim, to learn one Pater, to learn Shefer HaMitzvah. So he came to his Mashpi and said, what should I do? And the Mendel said, well, you should do all three. So he said to the Mendel, but there was no such proposal. The Rebbe did not say to learn all three. He said to learn one or the other or the other. So his answer was, Three ways we connect ourselves to the Rebbe, 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 to the Rebbe. This is awesome. It's a very serious exchange. Because everybody knows that the Rebbe makes us connected to HaKadosh Baruch makes us into Chassidim. That's what a Chassid is, an Hashem Yid. And not an Hashem Yid that's hidden deep in the deepest recesses of the Neshama because that's every Jew. But the Neshama Yid is Neshama is closer to the surface. In Emunah and in Simcha and in Betochen and in Chassid Seyrfon and in Lishan Esmei Deis Avativim and Tevabi Deis Av and Mestach that Seichel HaNushi should understand Seichel HaLaki all the points of Chassidus says about what Chassidus is. And the Rebbe gives us this Koyach. And we get this Koyach from the Rebbe from what we do. The Vayik Choyach. What we give ourselves to the Rebbe. So uh, this is the preparation for Gimel Tamar. The preparation for Gimel Tamar is to ask ourselves what I can do in my world, in my little world, whether I'm an official capacity of a Shliach or I'm an unofficial capacity of a Shliach. Every Yid is a Shliach. Every Chassid is a Shliach. Every Chassid is connected to the Rebbe and he works for the Rebbe. And when we do the things the Rebbe asks of us, this is our bringing ourselves to the Rebbe. That's called Yichu Lacha, which enhances the Vyata Tetzav as B'nai Yisrael, that the Rebbe, the Nasi Adar, connects us to Atmos and Musa and so forth, connects us to the Eibishter and to our own Alakos, and to our own Neshama, and so on and so forth. And of course, when the Rebbe finishes the Maimir, that the highest Madreig of this is that it should be a Nir Tamid. That not only it should be Mi'arev Adbaikir, Merubeke means that when you find yourself in a dark situation, so the neshama comes out, Adbeke, till this, that dark situation passes, and life is good, and then the neshama goes into hiding again. But there's a higher madrega, which is called Netamid. That the neshama is on the surface, not only because it's difficult, the neshama is on the surface because we're a neshama yid. Really, that's taka, the taich of a chosid. The meaning of the word chosid is a yid, whose neshama is on his surface. You see it in his simcha, you see it in his avas yisrael, you see it in his bittel. And you see it in a Zavayi of Apel Mamish. So the Ebisha should help us all that this Gimel Tamil should be only the good part without the negative part. And we should prepare ourselves for Gimel Tamil as we should. And the Ebisha goes Hatzlacha and health and Nachas from ourselves and Nachas from our children and all the Brachas of the Ebisha and all the Brachas of the Rebbe. And we should have this Galas and we should see the Rebbe and take us out of Galas, take it from the Yad.